We're going to be reading from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11, we'll begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Must have been an amazing thing to hear someone like John the Baptist pray to God someone who had had such intimate and remarkable encounters with God, unique in the history of the world. There were other prophets, but that was not a common experience given to men and women over and over throughout the years. What John knew of God's eternal purpose, the tasks that had been laid upon his shoulders, the burden that he felt for his people and for the unfolding of God's purpose in them, what it must have been to hear him pray, but all the more, what must it have been to hear Jesus pray? We only have a few examples in the scripture that list or record in detail the words that he spoke on occasions like that. I think uh, John 17, of course, the prayer that he prayed for his disciples, and then later the prayer that was brief and repetitious in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was begging God for deliverance if it were possible. But he prayed many times in his life. He who knew God even in a greater and closer way than John the Baptist or any other prophet before him. He who had been in the bosom of the Father before he became flesh to dwell among us. What must it have been to hear him pray? And so when the disciples heard him, we're not surprised that they would ask, teach us to pray. And he did. In verse 2, he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Now he said more than that, and we're not going to go on and look at the rest of this model or instructive prayer that Jesus presented to his disciples, we're going to focus our attention on that one line, your kingdom come. This comes into the theme of the meeting so far. If you have not been with us in previous studies, the theme of this meeting is the establishment and increase of the kingdom of God. And so tonight we're going to consider what Jesus meant when he taught his disciples to pray your kingdom come. So tonight we're going to be talking about the establishment and increase of the kingdom of God. I think this merits a little bit of review from what we spoke about last evening. What is the kingdom of God? Is the kingdom of God present in the world today? If so, when was it established? Is it now all that it will ever be? Or does it have a future stage? And is that future stage going to be good and glorious? Or is it going to be tragic and end in failure? If the kingdom will grow and spread and increase, how exactly will that happen? Well, these are the sorts of questions we're going to be working on in this lesson. But first, we need to understand what the kingdom is. The word kingdom carries four essential ideas within its definition. We have them represented in the top panel furthest from me. A kingdom refers to a rank, a rule, a realm, and a reign. A rank is the power to rule. Then there is the practical expression or exercise of rule. There is the territory and the people over which The rule is exerted, and finally there is the time when that power has been given and the authority is being exercised and expressed. Now the phrase kingdom of God, or its alternative in Matthew's gospel, kingdom of heaven, refers in the Old Testament to the rank, rule, realm, and reign of God himself. God, because he is God has the supreme right to rule over the earth. 
He created it for his own pleasure, says the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. It was made according to his will, and it exists rightly only according to his purposes. He rules over the universe by his decrees, which bring certain things infallibly to pass, and by his revelations, which inform his intelligent creatures what he wants them to do, and by his permissions, which grant certain creatures the ability to do things according to their own will, some of which are actually contrary to his revelation. His realm is the whole universe, spiritual and material, visible and invisible, and his reign is without beginning or end, from everlasting to everlasting. In the New Testament, these phrases find a new meaning, cast around the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus has received the kingdom from the Father, and he has a rank and a rule and a realm and a reign of his own. His rank was given to him by God the Father. His rule also consists of his own decrees and permissions and revelations. His realm is the whole universe, material and physical and visible and invisible. His reign had a beginning, and there will come a time when it concludes, when it accomplishes its purposes. Now, it's vital here to remember the Bible story. Last evening, I suggested that we could break the Bible story down into four related sections, creation, corruption, correction, and completion. In the first section, creation, God made the universe so that he might rule over it and receive glory in and through it. And then in the midst of the universe, he created earth to be his temple. And on the earth, he placed a garden called Eden in which he would dwell. And he filled that temple with humans, or at least that was his intention. He put humans as priests within the temple, ministers of the sanctuary, who would there be his image bearers and facilitate the spread of his knowledge and glory throughout the world. At this point, everything was very good because it was operating all precisely according to the rule of God. God spoke, and it was so, and it was good. The kingdom of God was intact and in order. However, in the second stage of the Bible story, the corruption, things changed significantly and for the worse. Humanity was led by Satan to rebel against God. God's rule was abandoned and his kingdom became broken and disorderly. Things were no longer the way that God wanted them to be and all kinds of problems and evils began to permeate the universe to its deepest and most fundamental parts. And in the midst of God's realm, a new rival kingdom was established seeking to wrench more and more power away from the Creator. This was the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of darkness as the scripture also calls it. Now at this moment, God might have destroyed the universe and it would have been a very reasonable thing for him to do because it was no longer accomplishing the purpose for which he created it. But instead, he began the third section of the Bible story, the correction. And here, God set in motion a plan to restore and redeem creation, to put down the rebellion, and to destroy Satan and his kingdom, and bring everything back to a stage of goodness once more by reclaiming it under his rule. Now we should note that Jesus was present from the very beginning of this story. The Bible tells us in passages like John chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1 that all things were created through him and without him nothing was made that was made. By his word and his power all things came into existence and found their order and structure and purpose and stability. But Jesus takes 
center stage in the correction narrative. And here we learn that God's eternal plan was to give his kingdom over to Jesus because Jesus was going to accomplish some important works that would ultimately result in what the Bible calls the restoration of all things. Acts chapter 3 and verse 21. Now it's very important to understand that the work of Christ is not merely a work of salvation. Sometimes I think people limit it to that exclusively. But Jesus is not merely a savior. The work of Christ is a work of restoration. And in restoring creation back to God's purpose, Jesus will indeed save what can be saved, but he will also destroy what cannot be saved. John the Baptist said that Messiah would come with spirit and with fire, with blessings, but also with judgment. Those who Jesus saves and restores to the kingdom are gathered together as the redeemed people of God called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, finally beginning to accomplish all that God intended humanity to accomplish from the start. When the Bible story ends in the last section of completion, we see a glorious vision of what it will look like when Jesus accomplishes all that God intended in the universe. The story is essential to appreciating some of the things that we're going to consider today. I want to begin with three questions which will explain the establishment of the kingdom of God. How did Jesus receive his rank? When did the reign of Jesus begin? And how is the rule of Jesus expressed? If we answer all three of these questions, we'll know a great deal of significant information about the Bible story and especially about this kingdom concept. Now you'll note that when I ask these questions, I'm putting them all in the past tense and sort of revealing to you that I understand these things have already happened. Of course, there are many people in the world who would insist that none of these things have happened and they put them off into a future stage even after the second coming of Jesus. As we consider the Bible answers to these three questions, however, I think that we'll see very plainly that a futuristic understanding of the kingdom of Christ cannot be supported by Scripture. The Bible is very plain in explaining how Jesus received his rank, that is, his right or his authority to rule. It was given to him by the Father. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Of course, Jesus said this after his death and his resurrection. And I believe that the Bible teaches it was because of his death and his resurrection that he received this authority. The authority was a reward conditioned on his victory over Satan and sin and the curses of sin, chiefly among them death. And this victory was accomplished by the cross and the resurrection. Of course, foundational to this work was Jesus coming to earth and being incarnate in the form of a man. During his time on earth, Jesus could say, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God has come upon you because in him the kingdom was inaugurated already. Its presence was already underway. But it was not merely his life but his death which established the kingdom fully and provided the means for rebels, for sinners in the kingdom of Satan to be pardoned and brought back into the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus famously told his apostles that death would not stop him from establishing his congregation, his church, and creating a people for himself in the world. But little did Satan know that it was actually through Jesus' death that he would establish it and would defeat death and sin, as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He defeated death in his own death 
Because after he died, he rose again to life everlasting. And he manifests his resurrection by many convincing proofs. And then the Bible says that Jesus ascended back to heaven. And in his ascension, the scripture tells us that he led a host of captives in his train. That unusual statement is found in Psalm 68, verse 18. But it's quoted in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, and the Apostle Paul applies it to the ascension of Jesus Christ. It refers to Jesus taking the defeated devil and the evil spirits and demons and making a spectacle of them before the holy angels and before God himself as he vanished from the side of the apostles on the other side of the clouds. The scripture says he was joined by an innumerable company of angels, the heavenly host in all of its glory and fullness. And they marched together with him in a victory triumph and behind him in chains were the old agitators and enemies of God's kingdom, Satan and all of his spiritual forces and powers. And they were led in this victorious parade through the gates of heaven into the very presence of God the Father. In Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 through 14 the Bible tells us what happens next. Daniel was caught up into the dwelling place of God and he was given a vision from the heavenly perspective. He says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. Now sometimes when we read a passage that talks about the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, we might be uh, intuitive to think it's talking about him coming back to earth the second time. That's not the case here. Remember that Daniel is viewing this scene from up there. He's seeing Jesus coming with the clouds of heaven up there. He is coming up to the Ancient of Days, to the throne of God the Father, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples and nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. The writers of the New Testament describe this in several different ways. Mark chapter 16 verse 19 simply says he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. In Acts 2 verse 34 Peter quoting from Psalm 110 says that when Jesus ascended the Lord said to my Lord, that is God the Father, told Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now do you remember what that phrase means? Some of you weren't here last evening. But last evening we discovered that that expression, a footstool for your feet, was an old poetic way of describing enemies being subjugated and brought under the power or the rule of a king. Sometimes by being utterly destroyed, and sometimes by being made his slaves, by being forcibly pulled out of the state of rebellion and independence in which they once lived, and now brought under his power. God the Father said, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. And Peter interpreted this to mean that God had given the throne of his father David to Jesus. That's what he says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 30. He gave him that throne, not on earth, but over the earth in heaven. It was not a chair, it was a position of authority in the culmination of God's old covenant promises to Israel long before. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11, Paul says that Jesus could have claimed the right to rule over the whole universe by his own nature because he had equality with the Father. But in the interests of God's plan, he did not. He humbled himself and he became a man. He was obedient to the Father's purposes even to the point of death on the cross. And for this reason also, 
God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now if the rank of Jesus was given to him on the basis of the victory that he won by his death and resurrection, then he has that rank now because he has accomplished that work. So the reign of Jesus Christ, which begins when the rank is received, has already begun. We know that this is true because all of the language that we have just read about sitting down on a throne at God's right hand and being given a kingdom and given dominion and being highly exalted over all peoples and receiving a name that is above every name. Well, this is coronation language. It's the language of the official installment of a king. And the Bible says that all of that happened when Jesus ascended and returned to heaven 2,000 years ago. If there was any doubt, Jesus demonstrated what had taken place in heaven by wonderful signs on the earth, two in particular. The baptism in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. I believe that when John the baptizer said that Messiah would come and he would baptize in the Spirit and in fire, that fire was specifically a reference to God's judgment against Jerusalem. This was the great and terrible day of the Lord that had been foretold by the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2. The baptism in the Spirit symbolized all the blessings that God gives to those who are redeemed into the kingdom. And the destruction of Jerusalem symbolized the judgment against those who reject the Messiah by the removal of old Israel and their replacement with the true spiritual Israel, the new Jerusalem, which had come down from heaven, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we have ears to hear and eyes to see, these things were designed by God and they were laid out on the landscape of history to show us incontrovertibly, indisputably, unequivocally that Jesus Christ has become king and he is reigning now. Now there's one more question along this line that we need to answer. How is the rule of Christ expressed? And it's one thing to say that Jesus is king But it's not much of a kingdom if the king cannot express his will and express or expect the people to obey it. If I told you that I was the king of Madagascar, but nobody in Madagascar knows it. I've never been there. I've never met any of them. They've never heard of me. They've never heard anything that I've said, but I'm the king of Madagascar. You'd say, yes, I'm king. Not very impressive. So how can Jesus be the king of the universe if Jesus is in heaven and his people are on earth. Now I don't know how Jesus rules over angels. I know that he does. The Bible says that God has placed the angels under his feet. I don't know how Jesus exercises his authority over the sainted dead. I know that he does Because Jesus said that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those noble, faithful men and women of God from the ages past said in the kingdom of the Messiah. I don't know how Jesus exercises his rule over infants, but I know that he does because Jesus said of such is the kingdom of heaven. I don't know how Jesus exercises his rule over the lower creation, centipedes and rhinoceroses and giraffes and octopuses, or however you say the plural of that, and uh, tornadoes and volcanoes and black holes. and uh, How does Jesus keep all that going the way that it should? Well, I don't know. The, The Bible affirms his authority over all those things, but it doesn't seem to be that interested in it. It doesn't explain it. It simply affirms it. 
But the Bible does answer this question. How does Jesus rule over the church? That's an important question to answer. Jesus, when he prophesied the establishment of the church in Matthew 16, 18, then said in verse 19 to the apostle Peter, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. This language about keys is an Old Testament prophetic image for stewardship and authority. Jesus was making Peter the custodian over the kingdom. He would be gone. Someone would have to take care of it in his absence. And it would be the Apostle Peter. He would become the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ in the world. And Jesus would communicate his authority to the church through Peter. Now that promise which was initially given to Peter is extended to the whole college of the apostles. In John 14 verses 16 through 21 and 26. John 16 verses 7 through 15 and John 20 verses 22 through 23. And the promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to them as a helper and began to work in them and those to whom they gave the gifts of the Spirit until they had received and delivered the complete body of the testimony and teaching that constitutes the will of King Jesus and deposited it in the Holy Scriptures so that it might be present for all believers in all ages throughout all time. And thus those who would be servants and subjects of King Jesus today know and obey his rule by continuing steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. That's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2. Jesus was already gone from the earth But his kingdom was proclaimed and people said, what should we do? And when they were pardoned and brought into his kingdom, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. Acts 2 and verse 42 says. Now what this means is that there is no reason why Jesus should not be understood as ruling and reigning now. His reign was inaugurated at his ascension. His rule is expressed in the teaching of the apostles, which is now given to us in the New Covenant Scripture and in its interpretation and application of the Old Covenant Scripture. And with all of this considered, it's very common for someone to object and say, well, if this is the reign of Christ, it isn't very impressive. I mean, just look at the condition of the world. Well, there's much we could say about that, and perhaps as the meeting continues, we'll say more. But I think that the most important response to that objection is to remember that the reign of Jesus Christ is not the completion stage of the Bible story. The reign of Jesus Christ is the ultimate manifestation of God's purpose in the correction stage. The reign of Jesus Christ is about fixing the broken world. That's the very reason that it's happening. That's the reason it was inaugurated to begin with. It's true that right now everything is not yet the way that it should be, but because of the reign of Jesus Christ, The power of God is now present in the world for everything to get there in time. So that brings us to our next question. How is the kingdom of God practically manifest in our lives and in the lives of our families and our communities and in nations and all over the world? How should we expect to see it increasing and progressing? I believe that the Bible teaches the kingdom of God in Christ is manifest and grows in four ways. Now remember, when I talk about the kingdom of God in Christ, I'm not only talking about the institution of the church. That's part of this thing we're discussing. 
That's a society that is formed and created through the work that Christ is doing. But I'm talking about the rank and rule and realm and reign of Jesus in all of its fullness. How does that grow? How does it go? How do we see it in the world? First, we see it through the conversion of the lost. Second, we see it through the transformation of the saved into the image of Jesus. Third, we see it through the unification of believers. And fourth, we see it through the increase of the knowledge of God the education of humanity to a better grasp of who God is and what God has done and what God is doing and what God wills. And as these four things increase, then the church increases and the kingdom of God fills the earth more and more and more. Where these things are not present, The kingdom of God is not yet present. It has the potential to be there. It's been inaugurated, but it's not there yet until these things happen in history. The conversion of the lost involves the preaching of the gospel. That is, the proclamation of God's work in ancient Israel, culminating in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and his death and burial and resurrection and ascension and glorious reign. Faith. In Jesus, which we're going to talk about tomorrow night. Submission to Jesus through repentance and baptism, resulting in justification by the pardon of our sins. This is how one who was previously a rebel against God in the kingdom of Satan or of darkness is taken out of that condition. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. Now the transformation of the saved into the image of Christ is also necessary. It's not enough for God to simply forgive sinners. Just pardoning criminals does not restore his rule over the earth. They're going to have to change from criminals into law-abiding citizens, from sinners into something greater, something that obeys God's commandments. That's why they need to be transformed into the image of Jesus. God created humanity to be his image bearer. There was never anyone on earth who was more perfectly the image bearer of God than Jesus Christ. He is the express image of the invisible God, the Bible says. And thus, we find our purpose in Him. We find the fulfillment of the very reason we were made by our conformity into His image, by our following His pattern, by our imitating Him more and more. And this is a a painful and lifelong process. The Apostle Paul calls it being led by the Spirit of God. And that doesn't sound too bad. But then he goes on to discuss that being led by the Spirit of God involves the person you used to be dying. And not dying easily. Not dying in its sleep. But being crucified. Mortified. Put to death. You take the old character, the old lifestyle, the old ambitions and loves and wishes and dreams and hope so's that had bound you to Satan and made you part of his kingdom and you kill those things so that when they die, a new life can be formed, a life in the likeness of Jesus. As the flesh no longer is the guiding principle of life, it is replaced by the spirit which has been led and filled and directed and educated by the Holy Spirit of God through the teaching of the Word of God. And over the course of many years, a radical change takes place, and one who was like Satan begins to resemble Jesus. And each time, a growth 
a movement forward takes place, the kingdom of God is more abundantly present in this world. Then we have the unity of believers. The unity of believers refers to the increasing oneness of heart and mind and the supernatural Christ-like love that binds all of Jesus' followers together into a great worldwide brotherhood by their growing apprehension of Christ-like character and the truth of Christ as revealed in the apostles' teaching. When you become more like Jesus, you grow closer to others who are doing the same and something amazing begins to happen. Old enemies begin to be brothers and sisters. The oppressor and the oppressed embrace one another and love one another and they take their swords and they beat them into plowshares and their spears and they beat them into pruning hooks because they've changed and they're going to study war no more. That's what the Bible says happens in this world when the kingdom of God comes to it. And finally, the knowledge of God refers to the understanding of God's self-revelation, which results in a fuller grasp of his glory and majesty and a greater strength to triumph over the lies of the devil. It is the result of Bible study and teaching and participation in worship and all aspects of the life of the church which God has designed for the edification of his people. Now you'll note that each of these four principles are mutually codependent and supportive of one another. In fact, in reality, one cannot occur without the others and one necessarily leads to the others. You cannot turn to God, really, without being transformed into the image of Christ. You cannot be transformed into the image of Christ without growing in love for others who are experiencing the same. You cannot uh, be transformed without growing in the truth, uh, the knowledge of the truth and will of Christ. And so these things all flow together in one great glorious direction toward one ultimate end. Jesus is making a redeemed people in this world, right now, by these principles, he's redeeming you and me and all of us by these principles. And when he is finished, he will take his people, now converted, transformed, unified, and enlightened, and he will fully deliver them from the curse by giving them immortality in the resurrection and utterly purging from the universe all the remaining vestiges of rebellion and satanic influence. And then the Bible says he will give that rescued creation over to God the Father for his eternal glory so that God may be all in all. That is the kingdom of God. That's how the kingdom of God comes and grows and increases. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, and Luke chapter 11, verse 2, Jesus taught his disciples that when they pray, are you one of his disciples? And I should change that, shouldn't I? I should say, when we pray, we should pray and open our prayers with a petition to this effect. Your kingdom come. This is God's purpose. And Jesus wants it to become our purpose as well. And because God has made us as his priests in this world, he has made us with a tremendous intercessory power where our petitions to him help to bring his will to pass in the world. And so Jesus said all of this can only happen if it begins to dominate our cries to God the Father, your kingdom come. Before you ask anything for yourself, before you say, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins and do not lead us into temptation, before you say anything about that, pray first for God's purpose to be accomplished. Your kingdom come. Now some people who have seen the problems 
with the idea that the reign of Christ is future and will not begin until his second coming. We know that that cannot be true. We know that Christ is reigning now. And so some people who have seen that have, I think, mistakenly concluded that this prayer is no longer appropriate for Christ's people. I've heard people preach that all of my life. In fact, I think I've preached that before. They suppose that when Jesus said these words, when you pray, pray your kingdom come, that all he meant was that the disciples should pray for the establishment of the kingdom through his death, resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Spirit. Now if that was all that Jesus meant, I would agree that we should no longer be asking for that to happen. I'm not in the habit of praying for the virgin birth to take place because it already took place. And I don't expect that it should ever happen again. And if Jesus meant pray for the day of Pentecost, pray for my crucifixion and resurrection and ascension into glory, if that's what he meant, then we ought not to pray that anymore. But I don't believe that's what Jesus meant. This example prayer, first of all, is given in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, which was designed to teach how we should live within his kingdom, not how people should live in the Old Testament to prepare for his kingdom. And most importantly, it is given in the style of Hebrew poetry. Now, some of us might not know much about Hebrew poetry. Some of us might not know much about English poetry. And it can be a little difficult to understand sometimes. But in Hebrew poetry, the chief characteristic of Hebrew poetry is a structure called parallelism. Now, depending on what uh, printing of the Bible you use, you will note that in certain parts of the Bible, when a poem is being recorded, you will see the lines are sort of staggered like this into two versets. And that's how you know. I'm reading a poem here. I'm not reading prose. Now, the two versets are coupled together and they work together to get the message across by relating to one another somehow. The first verset and the second verset are parallel in some respect. Sometimes they mean the same thing. The first and the second are just two ways of saying the same thing. Sometimes the second verset is the opposite of the first verset. Sometimes the second verset completes the idea of the first verset. The Beatitudes are written this way. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, the second verset explains the first one. But the most common form of parallelism in Hebrew poetry is when they both basically mean the same thing. The second verset simply repeats the idea of the first with greater clarity. It amplifies it and explains it. Such is the case in Matthew 6 and verse 10. When Jesus says that we ought always to pray, your kingdom come, he explains that he does not mean pray for the day of Pentecost to happen. He means pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's how the kingdom comes. That's what it means for the kingdom of God to be really present in this world. Not just for Jesus to be enthroned in glory, but for people on earth to submit themselves to his rule and to live out his will on earth as it is in heaven. Brother Steve's prayer was beautiful. I, I love to hear him pray. And he painted for us a very graphic picture of the disparity between earth and heaven. But the purpose of the kingdom of God is to bring heaven to earth. That is its purpose. And it happens through the conversion of the lost, the transformation of the saved into the image of Jesus Christ, 
the unification of believers and the increase of the knowledge of God. Jesus is calling on us to pray for the increase of the kingdom to its completion. And that work remains to be done in my life and in yours and in all the world. How does the kingdom of God in Christ come? By the rebellious world being conquered and reclaimed by Jesus through the gospel and thus restored to the rule of God. This is God's will, and he would have it become our will also.